Hackers Ñón, Hackers en Español. Ahí, ahí, perfecto. Ahí está. Ok, perfecto. Hola, soy Tibo. Y soy Rack 2. Y somos de Hacker Ñol. Queremos poner eh, videos eh, cada dos semanas en hackerñol.net para hablar de temas de hacking, activismo, vigilancia masiva, privacidad, seguridad, software libre, cyberpunk, en español para nuestra comunidad hispanohablante. Y hoy en este episodio tenemos una entrevista con eh, John Draper, más conocido como Captain Crunch, y con Bernie S. de la conferencia Hope. Eso es. Gracias. <risa> bueno, nada, la conferencia Hope es una conferencia que se hace en Nueva York cada dos años. Y es muy interesante porque de todas las conferencias que, que existen hoy en día, no es muy conocida entre la gente nueva. Y la razón de eso es porque nunca se han comercializado. Vamos a ver. La, y la razón de esto es por la comunidad que tiene esta conferencia. En, en de, vamos, en general, está todo, todo relacionado a esta revista que salió en los años 80, que se llamaba 2600. Y la revista en sí creó una comunidad muy grande de freakers y de hackers. Y fue la primera revista que básicamente, la primera comunidad, no revista, que juntó, organizó a los hackers del planeta y empezaron con su hackivismo, con el Free Kevin, el movimiento de Free Kevin, con el movimiento contra eh, la MPPA. ¿ah? de Motion Pictures Association de of America Eso es, uh, que le pusieron pleitos y vamos, el caso es que han estado luego entraremos más detalles en otro programa pero han estado siempre en el punto de mira de muchos gobiernos de muchas asociaciones de vamos e incluso de otros hackers que trabajan para el gobierno el caso es que esto pasa cada dos años es algo que no te lo puedes perder ves cuando puedas ir uh, esta es una de esas conferencias donde pasa gente legendaria uh, como Kevin Mitnick, el famoso hacker que estuvo en prisión Bernie S, otro hacker que estuvo en prisión que vamos a hablar de él más tarde eh, Manuel Goldstein, que es uno de los que formaron uh, la revista y también el programa de radio Off the Hook, también vamos a hablar de ello un poquito uh, gente como Rehack un Richard hacker Stallman. que salió hace mucho tiempo, Richard Stallman Uh, Redbird, Julian Assange ha pasado varias veces por esa conferencia y por la cadena de radio uh, Mitch de San Francisco uh, Negativity Land, que es un grupo de hackers también que hacen media uh, hacen documentales uh, con un toque político, Dan Kaminsky también el famoso que siempre está haciendo charlas en Defcon una de las mejores charlas que puedes ver también está obviamente Captain Crunch que también vamos a hablar con mucho, vamos a hablar de él luego, vamos, no mucho, pero algo. Tuvimos una entrevista con él. Y eh, deberíamos definir la palabra hacker para aclarar eh, la confusión que el, el media, los, los medios de comunicación eh, tienen eh, una definición de hacker que se acerca más a cibercriminal, ¿no? En los medios de comunicación lo utiliza más bien como cibercriminal, pero el hacker no es un cibercriminal. No, para nada. De hecho, uh, de hecho, hacker es muchas cosas. Antes de los ordenadores, de que hubieran computadoras, un hacker podía ser cualquier persona que pusiera una, un parche a algo, vamos, un mecánico que hackeaba el motor, el, uh, ponía un parche a la rueda para que funcionara. O sea, en el lenguaje inglés eso es lo que era un hacker, pero vamos, Básicamente los primeros hackers que, que fueron informáticos, si vamos a ir al tema, son gente básicamente que viene de la MIT, del MIT y que cogían cualquier pedazo de, de programa, un, de código y lo hacían mejor, lo hackeaban, lo cambiaban, uh, si supuestamente tenía que, que hacer funcionar una impresora, lo cambiaban para que funcionara la impresora y hiciera otras cosas. Básicamente es la palabra original de un hacker. Obviamente con el tiempo eh, la definición de hacker se fue haciendo un poquito más, a, más abierta y básicamente lo que pasaba es que muchos hackers en los años 80, obviamente cuando se dieron cuenta del poder que tenían, pues eran, hacían, les gustaba mucho hacer novatadas a la gente. Y claro, como decían, bueno, yo no me gusta que me hicieran lo, las computadoras, ¿por qué tengo que poner un password? Y obviamente formaban, hacían hacking para 
poder entrar a sitios donde no se les decían no, aquí no puedes entrar y así es como empezó básicamente a tomar mala fama pero obviamente no estaban haciendo nada malo estaban explorando era para uso personal en general es. y un grupo de hubo una, una guerra de hackers en los años 80 de Legends of Doom y otros y cuando hice una guerra entre ellos empezaron a, a destrozar, bueno a destrozar digamos que, que entraban en sitios donde no tendrían que entrar y las, los, las, lo, la televisión y otros sistemas de comunicación se dieron cuenta de esto y solo vieron la parte mala y empezaron a, a, a básicamente a llamar hackers a cualquier persona que, que estaba haciendo algún acto criminal con los ordenadores, con los computadores y obviamente se quedó con esa palabra menos mal que en los últimos 5 o 10 años la palabra hacker, por lo menos aquí en Estados Unidos, ha ido cambiando un poco. Uh, si hablas con la gente de un pueblo por ahí lejos, obviamente aún dicen, oh, hacker, el... el bad guys, este. sí. lo, la gente mala. Lo, Pero lo... si vas a ciudades grandes, San Francisco, Chicago, Nueva York, etc., ya la gente va viendo hackers como personas que tienen la capacidad de hacer mal, pero no todos hacen mal. De hecho, casi todo Internet está creado por hackers. Y básicamente cualquier herramienta que usas en el ordenador, si no está creada por hackers, ha sido probada por hackers, o la han hecho mejor, o la han modificado para darte un, un sistema mucho mejor que el que tienes para defenderte, de hecho, de los que son criminales. Y la palabra hacker eh, también es, sin es sinónimo de, o eh, incluye a todo lo que es eh, gente que trabaja en seguridad, eh, los que son eh, gente de... Uh, cyber uh, security researchers uh, uh, mi opinión personal es que no, no porque una persona una persona que trabaja en seguridad no tiene por qué ser un hacker puede ser una persona que ha ido a un curso de seis meses y le han enseñado a usar el metasploit le han enseñado a usar un tubo una herramienta <risa> y es lo único que hace todo el día en el trabajo está monitorizando a ver si hay un threat incident y sabe utilizar eso pero cuando pasa algo se lo pasa a otro que sabe más uh -huh. Obviamente esa persona pues trabaja en seguridad, está en el gremio, pero yo no sé si lo llamaría una persona un hacker porque no está, de hecho, no está cambiando nada, no está descubriendo nada, no está construyendo nada. ¿Entiendes? Para mí un hacker tiene que tener... Pero esto ya es, mi, es, es como personal. una cultura más. Tiene, tienes que de verdad meterte ahí, aprender todo, no esperar que te lo enseñen. Tú vas, lo aprendes tú porque tienes la curiosidad de aprender. Eso para mí es un hacker. ¿Y el, uh, ¿Y el hacktivismo? Hacktivismo son básicamente hackers que tienen una conciencia que casi todos los hackers, de verdad, tienen una conciencia y por eso siempre de los años 90 con el 2600 y conferencias como Hawk, Hope y el CCC en Alemania, que ya hablaremos de eso un día, están, tienen mucha política en sus conferencias son más de no son como conferencias donde es todo empresas vendiendo su producto esos son son conferencias que la gente habla mucho de política porque obviamente si tú eres una persona curiosa vas a leer libros de política vas a vas a vas a tener curiosidad qué es lo que pasa en el mundo no y como siempre un hacker quiere arreglar todo quiere parsear todo y obviamente que que me venga alguien a mí que me diga, un hacker es apolítico. No, imposible. ¿Cómo? Si somos gente que queremos arreglar todo. Vemos un pedazo de software que está mal, corre mal, lo queremos arreglar. Vemos sistemas que están mal, los queremos arreglar. Vemos una injusticia en África o en Estados Unidos o en, en Argentina y lo queremos arreglar. Somos los primeros que vamos a crear las herramientas para que esa gente que no puede hablar, hable. Que tenga una voz en Internet. Para que si le están poniendo una censura, vamos a, tener, a crear las herramientas para que ellos, aunque no sepan informática, aunque no sean hackers, puedan salir de su entorno, tener una voz. Para mí eso es hackear también. Ok, y volviendo a la conferencia de Hope, eh, Hope es Hackers on Planet Earth. ¿Cuál es el, la misión de Hope, de la conferencia? Bueno, la misión de Hope, obviamente, eso tendríamos que preguntar a ellos. Obviamente yo los conozco algunos de vista, pero... Pero no sé, pero básicamente mi postura de la, de la conferencia de Hope, porque ya he ido cuatro o cinco veces, es siempre relacionada a la comunidad, ¿entiendes? Siempre está en relación la comunidad, lo hace la comunidad, 
la única razón... Muchos voluntarios, ¿no? Está, sobre Eso todo es, tiene voluntarios. Muchos voluntarios. La única razón que básicamente te están pidiendo 200 dólares para entrar, que no es nada comparado con una conferencia de seguridad, que esto cuesta 2.000 dólares como Black Hat. Y o 3.000, 4.000, 5.000 dólares para una... Y tienes a 50 tipos que lo único que te hacen es decir, cómprame a mí porque yo soy el mejor y te sí. defiendo contra los malosos. Eso es como la no R R RSA uh, Conference, the Black Hat Conference, entonces Eso son es. para gobiernos, corporaciones. A cambio que Hope es más para nosotros, la comunidad. Es para las comunidades, claro. Y obviamente va a haber un poquito de todo. Y es, hay mucha política porque como te dije, los hackers somos gente que queremos hablar todo. Va a haber... Se van a, ha habido veces que han habido muchos zero days, han habido mucha gente, muchos contactos ahí, que el sitio donde mejor vas a conocer a gente y van a ser tus amigos de por vida, vamos. No es como otros sitios que son gente que dice, ah, no, este trabaja, voy a intentar hacerle un pitch, a ver si le puedo vender esto, ¿no? Y todos son tus amigos porque te quieren vender algo. No, no, el Hop es un sitio que de verdad si quieres comunidad, ahí es donde vas a encontrar. Ok, entonces vamos a la primera entrevista. Venga. Ok, primera entrevista con Bernie S. Eh, Bernie S, que es uno de los fundadores de la conferencia. Eso es. Hey Bernie, this is Tibo. Yeah, hold on, let me plug in my headset. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can yes. hear you, okay. Hey Bernie, thank you for uh, joining the call. And um, so I have my friend uh, Chris Fernandez. Uh, how you doing, man? I saw you in the what, conference. What's his name, Craig? Uh, Chris, Christian. Chris? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Christian. <laughs> How you doing? We were on the rooftop uh, together. <laughs> yeah, we I remember, yeah. I'm more privileged. Yeah, so, so he's the one you, uh, talk with, yeah. you talked with. Right. All right hey, Chris, so, did you get your did Chris, did you get your badge taken away too? Oh, no. I actually, I have more experience. So <laughs> when I saw people that I didn't know, like, uh, coming through the door, I'm like, oops, this is not good. <laughs> so I left. <laughs> <laughs> He saw it coming. <laughs> he saw it coming. Well, he uh, saw it coming. Well, Bernie, but he took a. Uh, yeah, Bernie. So Christian took. So Christian took, e Christian took evasive action. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. because I knew, right? Because you came out first, and you kind of like uh, told us, "Hey, you know, like uh, this is what's going on." So we kind of yeah. like uh, I was already prepared, right? Because I already was in a uh, in warning mode. So when I saw like a, uh, you know, like a weird thing going on in the door. I was like, okay, time to go. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally distracted. I was on the phone and I didn't know what was going on. You came to warn us. And then maybe 20 minutes later, all these people showed up from uh, party people from the conference. Uh, they were just there hanging out like us. And uh, so it was about 20 people up there. And then the security just came out, bursting through the door and screaming, we need to take your badges. And Chris, he just <laughs> ran away. He held on to his badge with his hand, you know. <laughs> Rule number one, physical security. <laughs> yes. Physical access, you know, like he applied that rule dearly. I didn't know what was going on. She just grabbed my badge from my lanyard and suddenly I'm looking down and it's like, shit, I have no badge. And uh, I, was, um, I was upset at that point. It's like, I should have put my badge under my shirt or something. And Chris mm -hmm. took, away, took off. And uh, so it was a bunch of people who uh, they took the badges from. And um, so then, uh, then that was it. Game over for the roof. We had to uh, leave. And uh, so all night we were debating, you know, what are we going to do now? Like, how are we going to do this? Should we, should we uh, make up a story how we lost it? And it's somewhere in Manhattan. It's in the water. <laughs> it's in the river. Uh, I, got drunk, I got drunk and fell in the river. Maybe they're going to believe that. And then we concluded that, you know what, well, let's just go and talk to them and say, apologize, say, we're sorry, we fucked up, we were on the roof, we were not supposed to. And um, so uh, that's what we decided to do. And uh, so the next morning, even, even if we didn't get our badges back, we, we, we really wanted to apologize because maybe we got the conference in trouble. We didn't know at that point yeah. uh, because the, uh, the hotel security was there. And uh, so we uh, went to see uh, the uh, people at the front uh, desk. And uh, uh, at first they were like, no, you have to leave. The hotel doesn't want you here anymore. Uh, this is not uh, okay. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah, that part. Yeah, they were really, they were really uh, mean. I think it was like volunteers. 
And then the yes. sister would say, yeah, yeah, we know, we're sorry, we fucked up, okay, maybe we leave, hopefully we won't, but at least we want to talk to security just to say, hey, we're sorry, and, uh, and then we leave. And uh, so they, uh, they called security, the conference security, and uh, so they came, and uh, so we apologized, we said, hey, we're sorry, we were on the rooftop, we fucked up, uh, we didn't, well, we, we, we just heard it's a thing to do the, uh, the roof uh, every uh, conference, you know, it's a thing, so we just... We just followed, we thought, oh yeah, we'll follow these people and... It was and, my uh, first fall though. <laughs> yeah, and apparently it's not okay to do the roof. So we, we told all that to security and, and uh, they said that uh, it, it's okay, uh, they didn't want us to be in trouble, so they, uh, had to, uh, they had to take our badges back just because uh, they had to get us out there uh, fast before the police showed up. And, uh, and, and so they said uh, they didn't mean to uh, be uh, a dick or anything, they just, uh, they just uh, wanted to, you know, they were thinking ahead of us, because we were drunk, we were stupid, we were on the roof, so we're not supposed to be there, and they did their job being ahead of, uh, a step ahead of us, so, uh, uh, so they said, you know, we're sorry for what happened, but here are your badges uh, back, but don't do it again. <laughs> Wait, so we got the badges back. It was, so it was cool. just too tempting. Like uh, I got like a text from uh, I I've been to Hope a couple of times before, and I already know some people. So uh, I got a text right. So and I was like, "Hey, we on the roof." And I was like, "What?" Like my eyes were like up. Like, "Oh, so how do you get to the roof?" So and they didn't want to tell us, right? They were like, "Well, figure it out." So figure it out. That was the war, right? <laughs> figure it out. Okay, we have to go to the roof, <laughs> right? So we were actually going to the bar, right, across the street. And then after that text, I'm like, no, now we have to go to the roof. So actually, that's how it started. So we started like, roaming around, like, looking how you get to the roof. It actually wasn't that easy. Yeah, it was know? not easy, yeah. Well, it's, it's like, if you've, if you've done it, I've been doing it for 22 years, so I, I can do it almost with my eyes closed. But <laughs> nice. yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of a maze. <laughs> what we're really trying to avoid, the organizers, you know, it, 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 the conference, the, uh, the hotel people, it does not make it, things easier for us when we have to get hotel security involved in something. But, exactly. um, but what, what, what we're even more afraid of is people tweeting pictures from the roof saying, look, we're on the roof of the Hotel Pennsylvania because those tweets will go around and they'll end up on Facebook and whatever. And then that becomes a big liability exactly. because, like, the, uh, the insurance company for the hotel can see this and, like, oh, we're going to have to raise your rates because you're letting these people up on the roof. And you're not supposed to have people, you know, and then that would really be bad. Yeah, exactly. Good and, you thing know, we don't use people Facebook or anything like that. You don't know what they're going to do. They could take pictures and then tweet them and put exactly. them on Facebook. And then it just, it could snowball into, into a really bad thing. So, um, you know, like I said, when I was up there, personally, I don't care if anybody's up there, as long as they don't get hurt. But it can have repercussions for the for the conference, uh, especially if the stickers ended up on Twitter or Facebook or whatever or Instagram that, that you know, hey, yeah. look, we're on the roof. And then, you know, eventually that would get back to the hotel sure, and the nice hotel's nice. Insurance, insurance companies. Insurance companies in the U.S. are terrible about that stuff. They're like, oh, we're going to have to double your rates now. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. no, we don't want that. And and uh, there are also all the equipment up there, the antennas for the conference, all these radio ham stuff. And, yeah, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think anybody, I don't think anybody was messing with their antennas. We put up a bunch of uh, ham radio antennas up on the roof. Yeah, um, not our group. Yeah, we were... We contacted, uh, we, we were in touch with uh, 15 different countries from that. You saw on the 18th floor there, there was a radio equipment we had set up on, a, on that yeah. table. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, we had contacted fifteen different countries with mm-hmm. only thirty watts of pow- with only thirty watts of power, um, and this is no infrastructure between the hotel and say Moscow, like no no internet, so just no, really- wi- no phone lines, nothing, just wi- completely wireless with thirty watts of power, nice uh, on, on shortwave frequencies between uh, between the hotel special event station and uh, amateur radio operators around the world. And uh, this is a good thing because, you know, in some countries the internet goes down, exactly. sometimes mm-hmm. sometimes on purpose. And uh, it's good to always have a backup form of communications. So are you... Even though it was low, even though it was low, low, low speed data communications, it's still, uh, 
it's still an important thing to be able to have a way to communicate with people around the world if, uh, if corporations I, or governments shut it down or if there's a natural disaster. You just don't know. Yes, yeah, so, so, so is it, uh, is it uh, relaying audio or are you relaying the internet through uh, ham radio? Neither, neither internet nor, nor uh, audio. These were, these were basically like text messaging. People were typing on a keyboard and it would appear on the screen in the other country and back and forth. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. Using, a, using a mode called uh, PSK31. And there was another mode they were using that was really slow, like just like like less than one character per second, but it was very it works in very noisy environment, like noisy uh, radio noise. Yeah. I so, did hear uh, I did know, hear this some is, This is really like you. This is not like web browsing. This is not internet communication. Yeah, yeah, this is point true. to point. This is point to point communications between point A and point B. You know, like like if you and I were texting each other, but then that's going through a whole network when you and I send a text message. Amateur radio is, there is no infrastructure. There's no network between you and the other person. It's, it's just directly through the air. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just one of the things we do at Hope. And then we, we, uh, we offered a class for people to study to get the license to do this. And then on Sunday, Sunday afternoon, we uh, administered the, uh, the FCC, Federal Communications Commission uh, examination, for people to get their license to be an amateur radio operator so then they can legally uh, operate on these frequencies and, and, and just do these uh, magical things. Hey, uh, so our podcast is for sp Spanish-speaking uh, um, audience. So of the 15 countries you said you were connected to, did you have any in uh, Spanish-speaking country, Latin America or Spain? Oh, yeah, yeah. Argentina and Chile. Nice. And uh, Spain. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, Puerto Rico, even though that's not another country. Nice. Um, where else? And if well, we contact we contacted Florida. There's a lot of people that speak Spanish in Florida. <laughs> yes, in Florida, yeah. <laughs> yes, Miami. And if if next uh, conference somebody wants oh, Cuba. to, uh... Cuba. We, we contacted we got we contacted Cuba. As well. Oh, really nice. Cuba. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, Rick Cuba. Oh. Yeah, and, viva. Viva Cuba! Viva, Viva Cuba, La Habana! <laughs> If somebody wants to join next time, um, they ju uh, how do they do that? They go on the website and uh, find out the page for uh, Hum Radio? Well, yeah, go to, you would go to hope.net, which the next Hope conference will be in two years, in 2018. Mm -hmm. It's just too much work to do every year. Um, and yeah, you, will, you can just, it would be under the, uh, the workshop schedule. Look for other workshops, and there'll be usually. Mm -hmm. we, this time we did the workshop on Friday on how to, it was like a a two hour study session on what you could expect to be in the test and what to study for and then Sunday around one o'clock we administered the test um, from volunteers that that have clearance from the FCC mm -hmm. and we I think about forty forty six people got their their ham radio passed the ham radio exam nice forty six people yeah. so that's that's pretty good it's and it's really Ham radio is like the oldest form of hacking. It's been around for more than a hundred years. Yeah, um, I did read about it. People, uh, people have been, you know, messing around with wireless communications for more than a century. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just another way for people to communicate around the world with each other. But it's been around a lot longer than the internet and even telephones. But it's still, you know, it's old. It's the, tech, the the physics have been around forever. Some of the new equipment is better. Like see, you can use computers now to send these messages instead of using a Morse code key. You can use a computer and, and have the, and you don't have to use, use Morse code now. Mm -hmm. And and there's uh, um, you know, it's just another form of we're all about communicating, whether it's uh, amateur radio or or um. So uh, Bernie, you know, internet. Uh, yes. So you guys been doing this ham radio thing since the start of uh, Hope, since the first one. Uh, not the not the very first one. I think it was. I don't think we started doing the radio station part of Hope, the, the amateur radio station part, until about twelve years ago. I think was the first time. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that was uh, maybe two thousand four, which was 
the fifth hoop. I think that was when we decided to set up an amateur radio station, and uh, it's gotten better every year. It takes a few hours to set up the antennas on the roof, and I get permission from the hotel, and they're okay. And uh, Bernie, uh, why is it important to uh, relay communications? Uh, why is it important to uh, uh, have um, this ham radio and this conference? And uh, uh, why are we doing uh, all this uh, work and... and uh, Um, what has changed in the last few years in that uh, in that space of co telecommunications? I, I, I think well, I don't know if a lot has changed in the past few years, but I, I do think that governments have been increasingly uh, shutting down communications in different countries. Uh, telephone, internet. You know how this happened in uh, in Egypt. Uh, I think it happened recently in Turkey. They mm -hmm. shut down the internet communications, telephone. You know. And this is another way you can communicate and get around the government uh, limits on what you can do. Um, and also there are, there are disasters, you know, there are earthquakes and floods and, you know, and all the, all the telephones can go down, internet can go down. Exactly. But this is just, it's just another, it's another way. I mean, it's not, a, it's not fast, it's very slow. But it is, it, it is, is something. It's, yeah. not, it's a challenge and it's, It's totally free. There's nothing between you and the other party you're communicating with. It's all... And just to think on, like, 30 watts about, you know, less power than an average light bulb, you can communicate with somebody halfway around the world without any infrastructure between you and them. Is, I think it's pretty amazing. And the that's, just one, mm -hmm. that's just one part of hope. There's so many other parts of hope. That's just one of many, mm -hmm. many things going on. Yeah, what is this going on at Hope for people who haven't been there? There's uh, workshops, there's uh, lots of speakers. How many speakers do you, uh, do you bring to the conference? We had, we had about 150 speakers this year. Mm. And, so uh, that's with three tracks. We, you know, there were three different rooms where there were speakers talks going on. But some of the talks were panels with maybe five people on them. But it all added up to about 150 speakers over three days. And there's no way anybody can see them all because there's three tracks going on at once. But... We put everything online as soon as possible, um, put, or you could buy a DVD there of a particular talk if you wanted to take it home. Mm -hmm. There are three um, three tracks, and then there is the fourth one, which is the uh, is it like like an open mic? Right. We call it yeah, we call it yeah, I call it an unscheduled track. Unscheduled Some track. Some people that submit, we get hundreds hundreds of people submit uh, uh, proposals to do a talk, but there's not enough room in the schedule to put everybody in, and we have to, I'm on the Sorry. speaker selection committee with the with four other people, and it's a lot of work going through hundreds and hundreds of submissions, and you have to, you know, analyze each one to see if this person really knows what they're talking about, did they give this talk somewhere else before, are they a good speaker, is the topic going to be sufficiently interesting, um, I, all these things, like if it's a panel, do these people get along well, I mean, there's, there's just, we, we exchange several thousand emails Um, to put together the, the lineup of the talks. I think three or four thousand emails this year just to, That's pretty just good. to you know, figure out what talks are going to be yeah. on. Uh, Bernie. Um, the, fourth, the, fourth, the, fourth, the fourth track you asked about, the unscheduled track, mm -hmm. some people who submit a talk, it does not get accepted, so they sign up for a slot in the fourth track. Um, or they just might be like uh, Lynn Albrecht, uh, Ross Albrecht's mother came. Yes. Yes. He's a, he's a Silk Road guy. And he, she she gave a talk. That room was packed full of people. Yeah, it was. And there. people want, people wanted to hear what she had to say because uh, no, even if her son was guilty of everything they said, it's giving him multiple life sentences without parole. It's just crazy. Yeah. And exactly. it was not a it was not a fair trial by any means. It was a very harsh so, sentence. Yeah. So uh, you know, I was a mother that cares very much about her son, and she's just trying to get the word out and ask for help. Was it But, the first time she yeah. spoke uh, publicly about uh, about the case? Oh no, she's no. been going. She's been going. It's the first time she's been to Hope, but yeah. she's been um, she's been going to other conferences too to tell you know to to try to get other organizations to help. And uh, well, I don't know if the Silk Road arrest was that was that more than two years ago or is that less than two years ago. Um, I don't, I don't remember. remember. Yeah, not two remember. years. It's probably more than two years. And, yeah. I think it was more than two years ago, but the case was really... They couldn't really talk about the case while it was well, while, before the trial. Exactly. Yeah. 
So, uh, Bernie, so, um, um, one, yeah. uh, one question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the 2600 community, like uh, the whole conference, the radio soft, the hook, the magazine 2600, how it relates, um, you know, uh, what's going on lately with all that movement? Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Like a roost, uh, just, just a few pieces of paper. In 1984, uh, Emmanuel Goldstein started it, and that that was because there was a, a previous there were these phone, there was these phone freak zines. Like uh, one was called TAP, T A P, stood for uh, Technological Assistance Party, and uh, uh, Cheshire Catalyst, who was there, the guy with the gray hair, he uh, he ran that for a while after somebody else ran it, and. And anyway, that, that folded. So then Emmanuel decided he wanted to start a phone freak magazine called 2600. And the 2600 is a, is a, an audio frequency uh -huh. that used to send over the phone lines and you could do some magical things with that tone. You can't now, but that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> they fixed that problem. But, um, so, yeah, the, the, it started out as a phone freak magazine, but then more and more articles about computers and then the internet people start, more people started getting using internet communications in the late nine, late 80s mm -hmm. early 90s and uh, that was still before it was commercialized so you know 2600 became more widely read and there were bulletin board systems and then uh, then there were some websites and uh, voicemail systems all about communication hobbyists they want to figure out different new ways to communicate and then um Uh, also, Emmanuel started a radio show um, in 1988 called uh, Off the Hook. Off the Hook. Mm -hmm. Off the Hook. And uh, that's been on, on WBAI for a long time. The show's been on the air since 1988. I've been on it for about 20 years. Yeah, I've been listening Every to week. you guys. It's like uh, well, 1997. I've been to it, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's fun. We, we like to have guests on. We had. Uh, we had my friend David going on the uh, the uh, speaker that gave the talk about the pirate radio in in Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you caught that talk, yes. but he, he came on he came on the radio before on off the hook the, the Wednesday before hook and uh, or a week before hook and uh, we got a lot of good listener feedback from that because it's just amazing stuff. Some of these radio these pirate radio stations that are illegal but are doing some amazing radio. Yeah, and, I saw that uh, a few weeks ago we had uh, we set up a, a live conference call with some people up in the state of Maine, the telephone museum up there, and these are people, old phone phone company guys that that rescued all these old telephone switches and put them in a in a barn, and it's a really first class museum, and we set it up so you could hear all the different old phone switching sounds that you can't hear anymore because they don't use those kind of switches. But uh, that was a really good show with a lot of really interesting sound effects uh, of these calls being routed through old, old analog switches and electromechanical mechanical switches and MS-10s and things like that. And um, I'm really surprised anybody listens to the radio show, but we've been doing it for a long time and people listen to it, so I surely we do. can do it. <laughs> And uh, do you have you any... Should call, uh, you should call in. You should call into the show sometime. Uh, while I'm in the United States, yes. When I'm back in Spain, it's going to be harder. <laughs> okay. Is, uh, is the conference available in Spanish, or is there a way to contribute a Spanish translation? How would we go about translating something and submitting a, like a text file with all the translation? It's going to be hard. Oh, you mean to do a talk, or, or For the, uh, have the talk to the hope train? Spanish. So the conference was recorded uh, in English, right? and uh, right. so if somebody wants to uh, provide a translation for, say, um, the, uh, the one, video below. yeah, one of uh, one of the videos, uh, can they? Uh, is there a way to do that, or uh, can they uh, just submit? Well, volunteers want to do it. That's great. I mean, they could uh, take the video and then, you know, do a closed caption for it. I mean, everything's going to be up on YouTube if somebody wants to. It's completely free if anybody wants to. Uh, so just follow the YouTube process for and captioning. Then, and yeah. then write transcripts in Spanish 
uh, and, and pose them on the bottom of the screen, Sorry. bottom of the, of the video, that would be that would be great. Just uh, you know, we don't we don't mind if people want to share this. We want the information to be shared. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I but think uh, we don't have the resources to do it all ourselves. But, exactly, of course. But yeah. if other people want to do it, that would be terrific. I would, we would like that. Yeah, most of the talks they are already up. Inter- uh, the Internet Society have set up already in uh, live stream, so that's yeah. pretty good. I've been watching the ones that I was not able to like cut. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot yeah, of. They did a really good job. The Internet Society. They yeah. really provided some excellent streaming services for us. We had all all three tracks streaming the whole conference, and people I, from all over the world were people from all over the world were watching. Do you have any plans for a traveling conference to uh, Latin America or anywhere else? Or Spain or something? No, Spain or somewhere? it would be a lot of work. There are a lot of other hacker conferences around the world. Yes. Um, and uh, they pretty much stay where they, where they are. But uh, it would be very difficult to do hope anywhere else. It's, it's sort of centrally located right in Manhattan. So you can take, <laughs> take a train there and you're there. Um, Yeah, and there's three main airports, right? Like around. Yeah, yeah. It would be, uh, it'd be very difficult. It's a very central location. It'd be difficult to do a hope at another location. We looked at it a couple of years, but and it's, it's just so- too complicated and yeah. more expensive. That, that's why it's every two years, right? Instead of every year? Yeah, it's community based too, so. It's not, that it's, it's just too tiring. I'm still tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm still tired too, and I didn't, I didn't do much. Yeah, I mean, we just be. Uh, I think it's a little more special if you have to wait a year for it, and it's just very exhausting putting it together every year. So we need a break. We just can't do it every year. We do it every other year, and that's fine. And that kind of alternates with the uh, uh, the Dutch or the Germans. Yeah, the CCC and alter- stuff. Alter- yeah, yeah they, they, alter- they alternate so we can, like the hacker camps we do, we try to not have them conflict. And if somebody wants to start their own conference, uh, do you have any recommendations since you have all this experience, 20 plus years? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. So, yeah, why would you, uh, what would be recommendations uh, for somebody who, want, who would want to start a conference? Say they, uh, there is a country that doesn't have any of those conferences and they want to start a conference like this uh, to talk about these issues, what would you recommend? Well, it's a lot of work putting on a conference. It's, it's no joke. You have to, you need a good team of volunteers. I mean, we have hundreds of volunteers that make it happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them are the same people, but sometimes you get new volunteers and old ones leave. But uh, we have almost 3,000 people come to Hope. And I'd say maybe almost 10% of them are Between five and ten percent of them are volunteers. More than five, maybe less than ten percent. Mm-hmm. But all the volunteers still buy their own badge because uh, if all the volunteers got a free ticket, then we'd have to raise the ticket prices for everybody. Yeah. So um, this is not the intent of this conference. Is not to make money. It's to it's to provide a really interesting and informative conference for three days in Manhattan, which is uh, pretty awesome. Nice. So uh, probably like one of the last questions, if it's not the last question, because it's been hard. So uh, what, like uh, there's so many security conferences, so many hacker conferences. Um, what have uh, make hope uh, keep it real? Like uh, I think for all the conferences I've been going since like the late 90s, uh, hope mm-hmm. and CCC is probably the ones that are being for a long time that still keep it real. Where like DEF CON and other ones, you know, they have converted to what hope is into like something else, like a very corporate sponsor, very, very big. Uh, they lost like uh, the traditions a lot. So how do you guys uh, keep it real? Like, uh, because that's hard, right? How do you guys do that? Well, we just, um, we don't have like a bunch of corporate sponsors and we are very careful about the speakers that we select. We know We don't want people coming in to try to sell, to be a speaker, just of talking about the product or services that their company sells. And a lot of our speakers, you know, they work for a company, but we don't want them to be trying to pitch or sell their product or service. Exactly. It's really about, you know, we really want to focus on on uh, on work that any, is accessible to anybody without money, you know, especially if it's free uh, free software. You know, we had Richard Stallman there. 
Yep. He's, he's one of our more difficult speakers. He's a very difficult guy to manage. Yeah, I know, I know. But I've been he, uh, watching him for a long but, time. <laughs> but, he, uh, but he really brings in a crowd, and people like to hear what he has to say. So, um, you know, and he, he offered to come, so we, we said yes. I mean, he's, a, he's kind of a, a legend in the hacker community. Yes. So, um, developed uh, Gnu Linux, and mm-hmm. yeah, it's really important. Uh, we had a lot of whistleblow- a lot of government whistleblowers, a lot of people that, who who took information from our government and made it available to others, so that um, you know information can get out to the public that really should be seen, so we can make educated decisions as yeah. citizens as to what our government's doing. Um, I mean that's a uh, Yes. It's something. Yeah, you pretty much put it. So basically, like, uh, one of the reasons I personally like Hope is because uh, you guys focus on the community, like, uh, real, the real issues that's going on and you know, not just in the hacker community, but, you know, in the world, in every society. You know, there's societies that, you know, the governments may be more repressive. The societies, like, uh, in the Western societies that um, governments may, they are repressive somehow, maybe not as much, but you never know what can happen in 10 years, right? Our government could become repressive. So it's really good to, like, have this information, you know, to give to people and a place to go, like the conference you guys are doing. I really ap- appreciate it. So I think in the name of uh, everybody, in, you know, back in our countries and our, in our, our language speakers, uh, we really appreci- appreciate because uh, I know there is people that takes a lot of knowledge out of this. I uh, have friends that literally have, you know, they listen to, like, uh, talks from Hope and they actually... Put mm-hmm. it in the neighborhoods, like uh, so everybody can have internet, not just people with money, you know. So we all. Right. And most know. of the most of the talks go all the way back to nineteen ninety four. Most of them are online, mm-hmm. not just the video, but the just the audio too. If people just want to listen, most of the talks you can just listen to them; they're fine because you don't you don't really need to see the pictures. Exactly. But uh, it's just a huge amount of of information. It's like we're just building a giant depository of of fascinating information from, from good speakers. Mm-hmm. And uh, we want to keep that, we want to keep that alive. Nice. So I think it's a great job. Uh, Bernie, do you well, have any... Well, it's better when people, you came, you guys came to hope, and if people didn't show up, we couldn't do it, because mm-hmm. the ticket prices to pay for the, the renting of the space and the tables and all that other stuff. And it's crazy expensive putting a conference together in the middle of, of Manhattan. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. But, but we, we do it with everybody and, we try not to lose money. Do you this, have year, a, they this year, they, they didn't lose money this year. Um, next conference would be in summer 2018. So, uh, That's right. Let's probably put it up in July. We don't know yet. Mm-hmm. But uh, we have to work that out with the hotel. But it'll probably be in July 2018 at the mm-hmm. Hotel Pennsylvania, which is right across the street from Madison Square Garden near uh, Penn Station in New York. And do you have any uh, last message for the Spanish-speaking uh, community? Anything in Spanish you want to say or anything <laughs> target for them? Mm. Let's see. I just, uh, you know, I want to thank you for uh, coming and for you know, interviewing me. And I'm sure that there's some other people from, from uh, other Spanish-speaking countries that came to Hope. And we want to make it uh, more accessible to, to everybody. Uh, even though it's all in English, you know, it's that way in Germany, too, that I think the mm-hmm. PCC Congress is. It's all in English, too, so you got to pick a, yeah, you got to yeah, pick yeah. one language that, uh, but again, I hope, uh, I hope people in your community decide to, uh, start transcribing some of these hip talks in Spanish so that, uh, that people can, uh, can read them and understand what's going on. Exactly, yeah. To be more accessible, basically. And uh, we'll translate this uh, call and uh, our podcast, we'll translate it in Spanish. So uh, whatever you say will we'll, uh, be translated to Spanish. So that's, uh, that's great. And uh, that's it. We don't have any other uh, questions. Yeah, just uh, thank you so much for your time. And like, uh, it was, and I, like I said, like, uh, I appreciate a lot what you guys do for the community all over the world. You know, it's, well, you probably you. don't thank know it much. enough. <laughs> I look, uh, look forward to seeing you again in two years. Looking okay. forward to seeing you again too, Bernie. Thank you very much. All right, take care. Okay, man. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.
eso fue una entrevista con Bernie S., que es uno de los fundadores de la conferencia Hope, sí. que empezó en, lo, en los años 90. Llevan ya eh, no, de hecho, 11. En los 80, él, él, a él le gusta mucho los sistemas de telecomunicaciones de radio y siempre estaba metido mucho en el movimiento con, con freakers y con gente de teléfonos. Vamos, que ya lleva un buen tiempo. Y eh, la próxima conferencia, no se la pierdan, en Nueva York, el verano 2018. Eso es. Oye, y perdonar que es un poco rata la entrevista, porque es que como aún somos nuevos <risa> aquí grabando, no somos nuevos en, para otras cosas, pero para estos sí que somos nuevos. Fue el último Así minuto y no tuvimos el audio perfecto y bueno, espero que con el, eh, los subtítulos eh, ustedes puedan entender el, el audio. <risa> eso es, eso es, pero vamos, menos mal... Menos mal. <risa> Vamos a la segunda entrevista. Venga, va. Ok, la segunda entrevista con John Draper, eh, más conocido como Captain Crunch en los años 70, que uno de los primeros Freaker. Freaker que es Fun... Uh, phone freaker. Fun Freaker. Que básicamente sí. es, es jerga para referirse a una persona que hackea uh, las redes de teléfono. Que básicamente que antes de los computadores estaban las, donde jugaban los hackers eran las los sistemas telefónicos que también tienen sus switches y tienen sus routers y tienen vamos antes del internet antes de la Pero computadora antes todo de mi eso también, o sea sí que... <risa> bueno vamos a la entrevista con uh, Captain Crunch venga vamos glad to meet you glad to meet you too should I call you uh, John Draper or Captain John. Crunch John? John yeah all right so famous Captain Crunch Very well known uh, for uh, being one of the first uh, hackers to uh, use the blue box to uh, get free phone calls. Yeah. Is that how it started? That's it. The, uh, that was in the uh, what years? The 70s? Yeah, early 70s. 71, 72. I got busted in 72, so it had to be around that area, early 70s. And everything? And, I, and basically, I took the rap for it. You know, I mean, they, they threw the hook at me, man. They wanted to lock me up and throw away the keys. Bad mistake on their part, because what I did was I was teaching everybody how to do it in jail. And that was bad for them, because then everybody knew how to do it. They wanted to make an example out of you, and then people started doing was the their, same yeah, thing. That was their bad mistake, because because of me, that uh, that got them... That got that information out to the wrong group of people. Because when I was in jail, every criminal wanted to make him cheat the phone company. Yeah. So I was pretty popular back then too. I'd have phone freak classes right in front of their noses. You know what I'd do? I told them that I was doing some hardware classes in electronics, and that the project was to build some local oscillators, and those were really the blue boxes. And I gave the frequencies out and everything. <laughs> Police didn't care. They didn't care what I was doing. It was all just sort of like uh, a kind of a ruse for them. And uh, that's sort of how that involved. So I wasn't uh, really, uh, uh, I didn't really want to do that, but they kind of forced me to do that. It's like Edward Snowden, he didn't want to live in Russia, but they forced him to live in Russia by, by uh, validating his passport. Yeah. Now he's living in Russia. There are so many uh, cases like that where uh, hackers who are doing either security research or white hat hacking or hacktivism are being taken as an example and put in jail. Same thing with Julian Assange. I mean, Julian Assange yeah. uh, was wanted in Sweden for such a frivolous crime. It was just ridiculous. And, uh, and the British government says, well, we'll... Uh, so he sought, he sought refuge in, uh, in the Ecuadorian embassy. He's there ever since. Yeah, he's still there. Has yep. anything changed since you were busted, you said, in 72 up Lots to now? Lots of things changed. They changed the system around. It took them 10 years to do it, but they finally did it. But by that time, 10 years later, the, phones, the, phone, the phone was so cheap to use, long-distance calls, that it didn't really matter that you, you can use a blue box because it's practically free. And then when Skype came out, And all the LVOIP apps came out. You could make free calls anywhere in the world for practically nothing. And now, and they're video calls, and the quality of the audio is far superior to the quality of the phone system. Yeah. If you ever used WhatsApp, uh, the WhatsApp phone system, uh, that's the best, highest quality VOIP app I've seen was WhatsApp. And there's Signal. Signal is darn good, too. It's better than PSDN. PSDN is all broken up and 
it's scratchy and not good fidelity, a lot of distortion. But uh, a signal and uh, WhatsApp are really good, you know, or Skype, you know. And you said Telegram. Telegram is also good. Telegram it doesn't let you do voice to full duplex. Telegram is just a text, text, yeah, a text system, yeah. You mentioned earlier you use uh, one in uh, the U.S. and the other app in uh, Europe. Why do you use one here and uh, another one there? It's because most people in Europe like to use Telegram over Wicker. Over here, it's that people like to use Wicker. It's just a preference in what country you're in, you know. In Japan, they'll use a program called Line, L-I-N-E. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah, it's not good at all. Yeah. It's uh, it doesn't go point to point encryption. Exactly. You get all these ads flung at you and all this stupid. It has hardware and everything on it. Yeah, it's a it's a pain in the neck. So what? I used it for a while to communicate with my friend in Thailand, but it wasn't that good. You know, the best thing that I use for video calls now is a thing called Jitsi, J-I-T dot S-I, M-E-E-T dot J-I-T dot S-I. It uses a, a web RTC, which is the XMPP protocol, same yep. as Vadium. It's encrypted, high, good quality video. I'm transmitting HD video from my place. It's good quality, very stable. Uh, so that means it's web-based. It's uh, yeah, uh, the JavaScript. Yeah, uh, you can any, any, any browser that supports web uh, web RTC, it'll work. Which comes with HTML5. Uh, so re any recent browser. So that Except means we'll Safari. see more applications. Except Safari. Safari won't work yet. Oh. So that means we'll see Firefox more applications having yeah. uh, encryption. Firefox and Chrome is the best to use. Firefox and Chrome. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So one question, probably like uh, on topic. So when you were like. Um, Back in the day, how did it occur to you to use the Captain Crunch uh, thing into the phone to see if you could get free calls? How did it occur to you? What's that again? You were like, uh, how did it occur to you to use the, um, how you call that, the El Silvido? The cereal box. Yeah, from the cereal box. How did it occur to you to use it in the phone? Well, you know, used the whistle to make free calls because uh, by the time I got a hold of the whistle, they took away that system. It was a much older system. And they switched over to, well, multi-frequencies. That's what the blue box sends. The blue box sends multi-frequency tones. And that's what a blue box is. They're different than touch tones. They're totally different, different, uh, different makeup of the tones. So it's not the same as, uh, not the same as uh, the touch tones you get. You just call up an 800 number and you send 2600 or blow the Captain Crunch whistle on the phone, you get a little chirp sound. And then when you get that little kerchink sound, then then you just do you do KP, which is known opening tone, area code and number, and then the start tone, and then and the call goes through. Mm. It diverts from the 800 number to your call. Oh, and what are you selling here today? Uh, you uh, have a T-shirt, uh, an unbox. This is a Donna box. What this is, it's a Tor router. So it it it, it's, it contains its own computer running Debian. I think it's running Debian. I'm not sure. And it's got Tor installed on it. It's got a very nice web browser for interfacing and configuring it up, so you don't have to go through any kind of complex, you know, configuration files and things who, like who that. Who makes the Anonabox? Anonabox. Anonabox.com. Is, is it a company? Is it a yeah? They're, they're they're yeah. They're located in Chico, and these are made in China. Located in Chico, Chico, California. Yeah. And so you said it's a Tor Tor client. T -O -R. Tor client. The Tor router. Tor router. Yeah, so I guess it, it, in theory it would be a, it would be a client, yeah. And so, so you just plug the uh, say the computer, the laptop, to these uh, with the uh, Ethernet port, and what do you need on the uh, laptop? Just a browser. Uh, this goes to your 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 internet connection. The other end goes to your laptop or computer. You can either do it that way, or you can just simply turn it on, put it in your backpack, and you can use the Wi-Fi router. That's got its own Wi-Fi. Uh, So it routes from its own Wi-Fi to the Wi-Fi of your coffee shop, and it also uh, does support most uh, captive portal systems. Not all of them, but most of them. So all the internet of uh, the computer would be routed through, through here, that, yes. through Tor? Yeah. Okay. So we exactly. don't need to set up any proxy on the browser, we don't need to no, set up any uh, Tor cli client, nothing, just a regular browser? It's set right up and it's all ready to go, built in. Okay. And what are the advantages of using this? For who would that be? If you want to remain anonymous, really anonymous, and if you're really worried about, let's say, your computer falling into the wrong hands, or if you cross international borders, sometimes they're going to want to look at your computer. 
It'd be nice not to have any Torah system on your computer. I went to Israel back in 1999 or 2000 it was, and uh, I had PGP on my computer. And that delayed me by 45 minutes or so to an hour because they wanted me to decrypt all my messages for me. They wanted, what's that one, Z? What's that one? They're real picky about that kind of thing. So if you don't have any of that stuff on your laptop, you won't be hassled. And you just simply tell the border, you just tell the border people that it's a Wi-Fi router because that's exactly what it is. You're not lying. It's just a tire, it's just a router. Never uh, mind that it's a tour router. <laughs> Do you have one bug that we can uh, show to the camera? Yeah. See how it looks like? Comes in a little box like that. All right. It's got a little pamphlet and manual inside. It's all the other information you need. And how much does the another box cost? You get it from them. It's 120. You get it from me. It's 100. Plus, I get to autograph it and. Uh, Plus, I get to autograph it, and it comes up with a free selfie. Yeah, free selfie. <laughs> That's great. Why is it important to uh, fight for anonymity? Because the government is getting there is too nosy into our affairs lately. The government needs to stay out of our face. Look what look at look at what NS look at what uh, Snowden revealed in 2013, man. When he came out with his Snowden revolutions revelations in May or June of 2013, man, it just woke the world up. At that point, they realized the NSA wants everything. They want to sniff the world. They want to know who is talking to who. And they've got and they've got all these different systems. They've got this Stingray system that that taps into the cell phone system. Oh, by the way, speaking of Stingray, if you've got Open BTS and smart enough, you can make your own Stingray in a backpack. But a Stingray basically intercepts all your phone calls in a certain given area, usually a, usually a closed area within about a block or so. Like if there's a demonstration, the police will be out there and with their little uh, Stingrays, but you, they're not going to tap you because you're using signal. There probably uh, are Stingrays right now at this conference somewhere, maybe. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it either. And. Is there any, what is the difference between anonymity, privacy, security online, freedom online? It's all kind of the same thing, really, you know, it's anonymity kind of covers everything. You know, I mean, you're anonymous, they're not going to bother you. If you're anonymous, they're not going to even know that you exist. It's always better that, it's always better for them not to know that you exist, as opposed to them knowing who you are, but yet still not getting to your data because you're encrypting it. If you're that way, you're a target. If you're a target, then they're going to put more resources to try to decrypt it. But if they don't even know that you're out there, then that's anonymity right there. That's important. It's important to like not be on their radar at all. If you're on their radar, then they're going to want to. If they, if they have a very good reason, they're going to want to decrypt your thing, and they can get in any computer they want to right now. And why are governments doing that? They say. They claim that it's to stop terrorism, but I don't believe that. I think they just want Big Brother control. I think it's all about control. control heaven of heaven forbid, and if Trump gets elected, we're going to be in a world of shit. <laughs> if nothing changes, what do you think will be the next 10 years, 20 years? I don't know. I have no idea. A pretty scary place? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Very, very scary. Where can people find you nowadays? If they want to uh, look at your work, communicate with you, facebook.com forward slash JD Crutchman. Can we show this publicly? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what do you do nowadays? Uh, so you're representing Anonymous? Do you work well, for them? I'm pretty much a, uh, pretty much a, like, not representing them so much as I'm kind of supporting them. Uh, technically, and uh, I'm also uh, not sponsoring them, but uh, giving, uh, endorsing them, I guess would be saying. Endorsing them, yeah. Endorsing them, yeah. Or I do all endorsed products. I'm also working on my book pretty much 80, 90% of the time I'm working is I'm working on my book. What, do you already have a title you can give us for yeah. the next book? What yeah, is it? it's called Beyond the Little Blue Box. Beyond the Little Blue Box. When will it come out? Couple, couple months, maybe three or four months from now, depending on uh, how soon I can get our Kickstarter project up to fund the, the printing of the book. Uh, where can we find the Kickstarter? What's the Kickstarter page? 
there's no Kickstarter page yet. So if you go to if you go to beyondthelittlebluebox.com, that's our website. Okay. You find out all the details there on the website. Yeah, we'll put it down. Yeah. Yeah. What other uh, products are you working, uh, endorsing, helping with? Uh, that's pretty much it. You know. I don't endorse something unless I know personally that it's going to be really good, you know. I mean, I have my own security people out at the thing, and as far as I know, when, in my knowledge, it's pretty secure. I mean, they did address a lot of issues when it first came out. The first earlier version was, was not very secure at all. But uh, with my help and the help of my security team, we were able to tighten it up a little bit and make it a lot better than what it was. And how can people help you get support? Do you accept donations? Uh, buy the book? Well, how can get people... Get the book uh, or contact me on Facebook and help, help yeah. support me. And and, uh, and follow me on Facebook is what they can do right now. Is follow me on Facebook. Because yeah. uh, those, only those people that follow me on Facebook are going to be in the know of when my Kickstarter project comes. Because if you don't know when my Kickstarter projects come, it'll probably be all over by the time you figure out that, that it exists, and yeah. then you won't get all these little perks that are going to come with it, like a like a blue like a blue Adana box, yeah, one with a Captain Crunch whistle as a thumb drive. <laughs> you're not going to get that, and the, and the thumb drive we're going to put software on it too, like PGP and stuff like that on it, so you can have a key management system. Mm. They can put all your encryption on the on the Adana box, so you can have everything. It's secure, uh, not on your laptop. And that way you're not going to be on anybody's radar. Mm. You stay off the radar completely. Do you have any uh, special message for Spanish-speaking people, since this is a podcast for Spanish-speaking... I don't know. <laughs> Except I really I really appreciated the, the response I got in Bogota, Colombia, a couple, three years ago when I went to the... Uh, when I went to the... Uh, uh, The campus party. I felt like a rock star, <laughs> and I want to thank all those people in Bogota who were very supportive of me. Are you going back to Bogota or any other? Uh... I'm not planning on it. <laughs> man, in Bogota, the altitude killed me. Man, it was cold. It shipped me. Yeah, it's cold. It's in the mountains. It's on the equator, and it's getting so freezing yeah. cold. You know, it's crazy. Altitude. Yeah. Well, yeah, I got I got a little bit of an issue with altitude. It really kind of sucked me up. Are you doing any uh, speaking, um, any world, uh, other conferences? Where can people catch you on the next if conference? They sponsor, if they sponsor the cost of me giving a talk, sure, I'll give a talk. Will you go to DEF CON, B-Sides? Yeah, I'll be there. You'll be there? I won't be to B-Sides, but I'll be at DEF CON. DEF CON, all right. I was at B-Sides last year Yeah. in Berlin. Oh, oh nice. And um, if people want to have you give a talk, they'll contact you on uh, Facebook? They or... contact me uh, through these numbers here, yeah, and then I will refer them over to my uh, my publicity manager who would okay. take care of all the details. Okay. All right. All right? All right. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank It you. It was a pleasure. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Eh, espero que les haya gustado de ser una entrevista con eh, John Draper, Captain Crunch, de los años 60, eh, 70, eh, muy eh, famoso de, desde entonces. Y, eh, por Blue y por su silbito de los cereales. De sí, el sil eh, así fue que lo llamaron eh, porque la caja de cereales se llamaba eh, Crunch, ¿no? O, Captain Crunch. Captain Crunch, era la caja de cereales que tenía un silbido y así fue que hacían los tonos del teléfono. Eh, ok bueno y bueno yo a ver vamos a explicar un poco a ver cómo lo pasamos nosotros vamos un poco ya dimos un poquito de historia así un poco la conferencia fue el bueno, viernes sábado domingo tres días fueron tres días pero nosotros llegamos el jueves por la noche sí. y ya el jueves por la noche yo no quería beber pero ella me vició ahí así que empezamos a hacer el tonto en la habitación y, y al día siguiente ya me levanté como mierda <risa> Pero bueno, vamos a ver, ¿tú qué, qué piensas de es, es su primera conferencia? Para mí es la primera vez que vamos voy a la a conferencia, Hope. Yo había ido ya antes a Defcon, al CCC en uh, Hamburg, Defcon es en Las Vegas. Había ido a B-Sides en San Francisco y uh, Hope es mi primera, primera vez. Y uh, me gustó mucho porque comparado con las otras conferencias me pareció más como CCC, que es un poco más radical, más underground, más este, comunidad. Defcon me pareció como más una fiesta grande de todos americanos. Eh, Hope me pareció como que más eh, al tema de más eh, 
hacktivista en el sentido de la, la política de defender a los derechos de los eh, de nosotros, de los hackers, activistas, de eh, los que trabajamos en la comunidad de la, la seguridad. Eh, si encontramos una falla de seguridad, el gobierno eh, pone sentencias muy fuertes a la, a la gente y los pone en, en prisión. Y entonces toda esta gente de la comunidad, eh, hay muchos abogados, hay muchos... Este, eh, gente que sabe del tema de eh, cómo eh, eh, hablar con el gobierno para eh, eh, a, cómo manejar el sistema para sacar a la gente de la prisión eh, comparación entre este caso que lo metieron en prisión con, eh, porque fue era algo relacionado con el tema de computadores y seguridad eh, comparado con otro gente que ha ido a prisión por otros temas de homicidio y tal y hay una gran diferencia en, en, en las sentencias de la gente de eh, temas de seguridad de computadoras son muy fuertes las sentencias quieren hacer un ejemplo entonces esta comunidad Job, me pareció que está bien enfocada en eh, ayudar a esta gente en prevenir en eh, 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 sí eso me pareció que era bastante eh, activista en este sentido. No, es original, vamos. Sí. Es, es, sí. es como era cuando yo empecé en los 80, así es como era. Yo era un niñito y toda esta gente, Bernie S y, y vamos, y Fibrotec, toda esa gente eran mayores y, y eran mis, no mis ídolos, pero vamos, siempre estaba leyendo de ellos, ¿entiendes? Eh, me conectaba a BBS y todos los documentos eran de ellos. Y yo, mierda, esta gente, y mira, y ahora voy a estas conferencias, los conozco y aún siguen ahí siguen aún por la comunidad, nunca se vendieron, nunca hicieron un producto y se hicieron millones, nunca hicieron una compañía que está en Silicon Valley, nunca intentaron explotar a nadie. Y, aún, y eso, vamos, eso para mí tiene mucho mérito. Me gustó que estaba, el, uh, como siempre ahí, el EFF, que es el uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, Free eh, Foundation. el FSF, Bien. Free Software Foundation, el uh, está GNU, la Cruz, la Cruz Negra Americana, que es un grupo de anarquistas que dan soporte a la gente que tiene problemas psicológicos, que son soporte a prisioneros, sobre todo, ayudan a, a prisioneros, a compañeros hackers que están en prisión, como Jeremy Hammond, uh, recaudan fondos, bueno, ustedes pueden verlo en Wikipedia, donde quieran. Estaba Está también... La American Civil Liberties Union. Eh, a, a ACLU. Estaba también el eh, Freedom, of the Press. Freedom of the Press. Freedom of the Press. Y justamente Freedom of the Press tenían eh, B-Crypt, tenía eh, posca, eh, tarjetas postales para enviar a Chelsea Manning a Eso prisión. Eh, entonces llenamos una tarjeta para eh, dar soporte moral a Chelsea Manning. Eh, estaba eh, Lynn Ulbridge, que es la mamá de Ross Ulbridge. El, sí, el, 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 el allegedly eh, así fue bueno, como lo sí, inculparon supuestamente, supuestamente sé, la historia del Sí, okay. el Capit eh, Capitán uh, Dreadful uh, Parrot Sí, algo así en inglés raro, sí. vamos. Eh, y, eh, <risa> y entonces ella estaba ahí explicando el algo caso Sí, ella estaba <risa> 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 Ella estaba ahí defendiendo a su hijo, eh, explicando la importancia de ese caso, porque la sentencia fue particularmente fuerte, y eh, explicando cuál es la consecuencia de ese caso en particular a la comunidad en general, porque están eh, eh, tomando... Eh, ese es uno de los casos en los que están haciendo un ejemplo eh, muy fuerte eh, eh, para él. Jeremy Hammond es otro que lo, lo, le dieron una Compañero. sentencia muy fuerte. Eh, hay una campaña para Free Jeremy ha uh, Hammond eh, eh, Estaba Mitch Altman también, aquí vecino de San Francisco de Que Mitch Altman es alguien que ha eh, llevado mucho tiempo en la comunidad también Y él ha creado un hackerspace aquí muy famoso que se llama Noisebridge eh, Y bueno, había mucha gente de IFF eh, lo que me gusta también de la conferencia es que hay workshops, tienen eh, no solo charlas, tenían como 100, ¿no? 100 eh, speakers, sí, era, 150. Había talleres, y eran y talleres sí. sí. Algunos talleres eran como escribir a exploits, uh, habían talleres de política, Disassembly. Como, como hacer tu propia radio pirata, si quieres tener una radio para divulgar tus conocimientos a, a la gente de tu barrio, lo que sea, vamos, que, que a nosotros... Nos puede parecer una tontería, pero hay muchos países donde la gente no tiene los recursos y una radio pirata es, es importante, vamos. Sí. 
Sí, todo lo, todo el, el, la manera de difundir la información, mientras más se difunda la información, mejor. Que sea por eh, radio, que sea por eh, modem, hay países que todavía utilizan modem. Walkie-talkie, vamos. Walkie-talkie, walkie ¿no? el internet rápido, banda ancha, banda uh -huh. pequeña, banda baja. Eh, eh, mientras o oh, eh, también en, 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 en periódico en papel también es sí. importante seguir el trabajo tiene el sign de hecho el 2600 que hoy estamos hablando era uno de los primeros hacker signs que han habido pero recomiendo mucho el sign frac puedes ir a frac.org creo que es si no búscalo frac con ph ph sí. la mejor mm -hmm. eh, la mejor revista de hacking que existe muy vieja, ¿no? O sea, tiene, tiene tiempo de hecho, muy es establecida. muy popular porque ha salido mucho, muchas vulnerabilidades grandísimas, como el Buffer Overflow. Se publicó ahí la primera vez. Sigue cada, cada vez que sacan un número, te vienen como 10 artículos, pero tiene una calidad enorme y son buenísimas. Y aún siguen, vamos, siguen verdadera, verdaderos a la causa aún, que es lo, la otra cosa que me gusta. Sí. El buffer of Floyd, también yo me acuerdo de, de haber leído mucho de frac por las pistas magnéticas de las tarjetas de, de pago. Ah, también, sí, para de carga. Había mucho trabajo ahí en frac. Uh -huh. ¿Y a ti qué te gustó de la conferencia? Bueno, a mí me gustó, comparado con otros años, me ha gustado mucho que he visto a, la, a la, nuestra comunidad, las he visto un poquito más mayor, nos hacemos mayores, desgraciadamente. Así que, cuando, la primera vez que fui en el año 2000, 99, 2000, así. Éramos todos, teníamos 20 años, teníamos, éramos unos soñadores y queríamos cambiar el mundo, pero de una manera más de hablar y de querer que de, de realmente poder. Desde ahí hasta ahora he visto cómo la comunidad ha madurado mucho, se ha, ha tomado parte en la sociedad, ha tomado, hemos puesto nuestras raíces bien fuertes en la sociedad ahora mismo. Y desde ahí estamos haciendo cambios grandes, no solo en leyes, en políticas, en, en acciones de gobierno, en, en libertades. Eso es lo que, lo que he visto. Uh, he visto compañeros, tanto en, en la parte ilegal, ilegal, que están manejando, están manejando mucho mejor, más inteligentemente, tienen más cuidado de lo que hacen, tienen más cuidado de cómo se hacen las cosas, mucha más experiencia. Cuando tratas con temas de gobierno, eh, tenemos abogados, tenemos gente que básicamente cuando teníamos 20 años, la mitad casi todos estaban en el colegio o sabían, los habían tirado del colegio o estaban en la universidad. Ahora hemos crecido cuando ya tenemos abogados, tenemos gente que está metida en instituciones, tienen organizaciones, tienen NGOs, tienen como la FC que vamos, que ya estamos en una posición de que estamos ya cambiando el mundo un poco y eso es por lo que ahora tenemos un peligro mucho más grande por eso nos están atacando mucho más desde fuera pero vamos, yo me estoy contento uh, ha habido muchas camaradas como el, el de la rana que ya sabéis lo que es eso <risa> que es, están haciendo muy buenas cosas a uh, compañeros como mi amigo Cooper que está haciendo muchas cosas buenas en la IFF, de hecho hicieron el uh, Don't Track Me, eh, hicieron el, um, ¿qué es la otra, el otro plugin que tienen? Tienen el Panoptic Click, eh, el Panoptic Click tienen el, es el, 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 el HTTPS Everywhere. Ese, no, pero tienen el nuevo, que es súper popular, que están dando, están dando certificados gratis a la gente. Let's Encrypt. El Let's Encrypt, exactamente, eso también es de la comunidad nuestra, bueno, nuestra nuestra, que nos gusta lo mismo, pero vamos, es de la, de la Electronic Frontier Foundation, básicamente. De todo eso, nuestros amigos tienen mucho que ver ahí. Mozilla también, ¿no? Eh, eh, eso es. Eh, con Let's Encrypt. Están involucrados, ¿no? ¿Quién? Mozilla. Sí, Mozilla también. Obviamente sí. es una, una coalición, pero claro. la, la gente que tuvo la idea primero claro, está claro. hablando. Básicamente eran co gente, compañeros. Vamos, que estoy contento. Y cada vez que voy, no fui la última vez. Y desgraciadamente estaba lejos, no tenía tanto dinero y, y fui a Descon y no fui ahí y es una pena porque la verdad voy a Descon porque está cerca pero me gusta mucho más home, mucho más. Y la verdad es que vale la pena las, las cinco horas de viaje. Eh, veo amigos que no he visto hace mucho tiempo de la costa este, de Europa, de Latinoamérica y no sé, me gusta, me gusta. 
El, 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 dentro de dos años vamos a volver y a ver que nos faltó hacer un shout out uh, hemos hablado de Free German Hammond, de Russell Bridge, eh, Chelsea Manning nos faltó hablar de Julian Assange de Wikileaks ah, es. que Aquí también bien. él es un activista trabajando muy duro para eh, denunciar a los gobiernos eh, para pedir eh, accountability para que el, los gobiernos sean tomen responsabilidad por sus acciones, eh, como toman acciones en secreto que van en contra de los principios de la democracia y de las leyes del país y no tiene ninguna con consecuencia, lo pueden hacer impunemente. Julian Assange, que dice, está trabajando duro eh, para eh, contrarrestar eso. Y Edward Snowden, que eh, hizo una... De un acto heroico, vamos. Sí. Eh, Sobre todo desde la posición que tenía dentro del mm. gobierno. Bueno, sí. Aunque fuera como un contractor, un análisis, pero aún así hay que tener un par... Sí, un sacrificio enorme y eh, la, la revelación que, el, que salió a raíz de eso, de todos los documentos, es algo impresionante que el gobierno de Estados Unidos, de eh, la Unión Británica y Gran Bretaña y eh, eh, están apoderándose demasiado de las redes de comunicación y ya aun cuando estamos hablando inocentemente de cualquier cosa eh, nos están monitoreando, están grabando las conversaciones están eh, ellos mismos hackeando a los sistemas de... pirateando a los sistemas de... Eh, tecnológicos de VPN, están eh, los routers, están se están metiendo en los proveedores de eh, internet eh, se están metiendo en todos lados y eso no... Bueno, sí, y también... Vivas donde vivas, piensa que no se puede dejar de denunciar a cualquier país, gobierno. Hay que dejar los nacionalismos al lado. Si alguien está haciendo algo mal, hay que denunciarlo. Hay que quitarse a veces nuestra, nuestra línea, nuestro, nuestras camisetas y decir, vamos, sea Estados Unidos, ¿entiendes? Sobre todo, el problema que tiene Estados Unidos no es que que sea lo peor del mundo, vamos, ¿entiendes? Porque comparado obviamente con otros sitios. El problema es que hay que denunciarlo también. Y uno de los problemas que tiene Estados Unidos en particular es que se las dan de cordero y luego son medio lobos. Ese es el problema que tiene. Ahora, que son el lobo, el lobo padre a lo mejor no tampoco, ¿entiendes? Pero no hay que mirarlo así. Si Estados Unidos está haciendo algo mal y va ahí diciendo, no, nosotros que somos la libertad, no. Hay que denunciarlos, hay que buscar la información y hay que sacarlos a la luz para que la gente sepa quiénes son, ¿entiendes? Porque lo peor que hay es un falso, que vaya una persona a la televisión y diga nosotros somos el mejor país del mundo, vengan aquí, libertad para todos, y luego resulta que no es así, exactamente. Y eso es una de las cosas que mucha gente dice, ¿por qué Assange está, la tiene con Estados Unidos? No es que la tenga con Estados Unidos. Es que cada vez que miran a algún lado sale mierda de Estados Unidos. Sí. Yo creo que no, no, no es aposta, ¿entiendes? Y obviamente, él, desde que era un niño, obviamente como hacke, como explorador, siempre ha estado metido con cosas. Estuvo líos con Estados Unidos ya cuando era más niño. Pero es lo que yo digo. Es, a ver, ¿quiénes son los que... A ver, si tú estás viviendo en Australia y tú quieres cambiar el mundo o piensas que aquí hay cosas malas, ¿cuál es el país donde tú mirarías... A ver, ¿quién tiene bombas atómicas? ¿Quién es el que está siempre en una guerra constante? Estados Unidos, entonces ¿dónde vas a poner los ojos? ¿Entiendes? Ahora, que eso significa que la gente de aquí está, que van a cortar la cabeza como hace ISIS o otros? No, obviamente. Cada cosa tiene su lugar, pero no por eso tenemos que dejar de denunciar. Claro. Eh, esa es nuestra responsabilidad cívica. Entonces, como ciudadanos es de... Eh, eh, respeta, eh, asegurarnos de que nuestros derechos como ciudadanos estén eh, respetados y que haya un balance de poder entre el pueblo y el gobierno y eh, el gobierno ya, por <risa> ok y eh, <risa> y la semana que viene ¿a dónde vamos? la semana que viene vamos a ir a Defcon uh, bueno vamos de hecho primero vamos a la B-Sides que B-Sides es algo nuevo, vamos a hacer un programa sobre Visa y Defcon, pero Visa es también muy comunitario, 
Uh, también van algunos camaradas. Es buena gente, pero es muy nuevo. Se hace en todas las ciudades. Y es como una mezcla entre Hop y Defcon. ¿Entiendes? Está bien. Si tenéis la oportunidad de ir, ir, obviamente. No es, no es tan malo el único. La única conferencia que os voy a decir que no te gastes el dinero es Black Hat. Es la única. Las demás todas tienen sus cosas buenas. Pero vamos, vamos a ir a Visais. Eh, que se hace, de hecho, la razón que Visais se, se llama Visais y se hace al mismo tiempo que Black Hat es para eso, para que la, los compañeros, los hackers que no tienen mucho dinero, puedan ir a una conferencia antes de Defcon sin tener que gastarse dos mil dólares y lo hacen exactamente los mismos días. Es como una opción. Y así es como empezó Visais. Y eh, entonces vamos a B-Size Las Vegas, eh, vamos a Defcon Def 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 Las Vegas, va a ser toda la semana, la semana que viene. Siete días, le llaman el Hacker Camp, el campamento de los hackers. Yeah. Así, es la, así es la televisión de aquí, vamos. Sensacionalismo. <risa> que vienen los hackers a Las Vegas. <risa> 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 ok, y eh, si ustedes están en algún sitio que no tienen acceso a, a este tipo de conferencias, no tienen acceso a este tipo de... Claro, porque nosotros aquí en la Silicon Valley tenemos acceso a muchas cosas, afortunadamente. Si ustedes no tienen acceso o si tienen poco, quieren más, ¿qué puede eh, hacer la gente? ¿Acceso a qué? Eh, por ejemplo, eh, Hackerspace, pueden empezar por hacer un Hackerspace. Ah, ¿tú te refieres a comunidad? Sí, que, ah, que para, para crear una idea. comunidad. Sí, obviamente. Todo depende de ti, no esperes que los demás hagan nada nunca por ti, porque eso nunca va a pasar. Entonces, si a ti te gusta mucho, mucho tu comunidad, si estás aprendiendo mucho de, de otros hackers más mayores que tú, es tu manera de dar para atrás, ¿entiendes? Es, 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 tú recibes, pero también das. Básicamente, en tu ciudad, créate un hackerspace. ¿Y qué es un hackerspace? Uh, un hackerspace es, un, bueno, puede ser mil cosas, pero vamos, el hackerspace... El típico de siempre es un, básicamente, puedes arriendar o alquilar un, un local entre un grupo de 10 personas o en tu habitación, si no tienes dinero, tienes una reunión, coges a tres o cuatro personas de tu comunidad que estáis interesados en lo mismo y intercambias inf op, uh, información, uh, Facebook, hagan proyectos juntos, hagan proyectos juntos, crean software juntos. ¿Cómo hacer un setup de Wi-Fi seguro? ¿Cómo hacer un setup de VPN? ¿Cómo sí. hacer un setup de, de un Tor? Un, un, un tor uh, uh, ¿Cómo utilizar un Tor Browser es. para la anonimidad? ¿O cómo hacer uh, setup un sí. Tor uh, Router también? Sí, empiezan así y cuando ya tienen un poquito ya más de experiencia, entonces lo que tienen que hacer es abrirse a la comunidad. Y entonces todo lo que ustedes han aprendido por sí mismos se lo enseñan a los demás. Y así vas creando, vas enseñando a ver, ¿cómo, por qué no usa mamá y vecino, por qué no usan WhatsApp, por qué tienen que usar Signal, ¿entiendes por qué? Y va explicando, va cambiando a la gente poco a poco. Y básicamente como cualquier otro movimiento, ¿no? Vas... Eh, Crypto Party también es muy bueno. Crypto Party es algo también que se hace para intercambiar claves, para básicamente... Estás enseñando a la gente a usar uh, PGP eh, para, para empezar a entender todo este sistema de, de, de la encripción, porque es importante la encripción para mantener nuestra privacidad, porque el gobierno eh, se mete en todas las comunicaciones, aunque sea para comunicaciones inocentes. Entonces Exacto. hay que saber de eh, no encripción. Gobierno, es que puede ser cualquier mafia, porque te puedes meter un, pro un problema y. Las vamos, corporaciones, ¿sí? sí. Puede ser cualquier cosa. O los cibercriminales también se meten. Eso es. El cripto va a proteger tus datos, tus cosas del banco, vamos, tu vida privada, cosas sí. que tú no quieres que nadie sepa, y ya. Oye, el cripto party también puede ser para este, cómo enseñarle a la gente a hacer un full disk encryption en el, en el encripción de, de disco completo para que si se te pierde la laptop en un taxi o en un hotel o en algún sitio, eh, para que los datos no sean accesibles, tienes que tener el disco encriptado. Eh, también pueden difundir información como sea en la universidad, en tu escuela, sí. eh, puedes hacer este, si tienes algún sitio donde a, a poner afiches, información de eh, cualquier tipo, películas, si hay alguna película, un documental. Corregir a la gente cuando dicen open source, sí. que tienen que decir software libre. Eh, sí, open source, software libre. Decirles qué diferencia hay entre software libre y el open source. Uh, vamos. La diferencia de hacker, si alguien utiliza la palabra hacker, hacker o eh, criminal, haz la diferencia. Uh, 
Claro. Eh, y democráticamente, acción directa también. Acción directa es algo muy popular hace muchos años entre compañeros y ahora, mismo, ahora que tenemos sistemas digitales, también se hacen sistemas digitales. Eh, también eh, Hope está en inglés y si ustedes quieren traducirlo, eh, Bernie nos dijo que para traducir los vídeos de Hope están en YouTube, Exacto. entonces sigue ah, el... Aún no están en YouTube, están en el otro sitio, en el... En el live stream. En el, el, ¿no? el live stream, ese, sí. no sé qué, pero los van a poner en el canal de 2600, los van a poner ahí eventualmente. Y entonces sigue el proceso de traducción ahí. Él dijo que le iban a poner en YouTube, entonces en YouTube es sí. fácil hacer la traducción, solo tienes que escribir de un, un fichero de texto con el timestamp, hay herramientas que lo hacen. Hagan la traducción y lo ponen en, eh, en el, ahí en el YouTube. Y de, luego de ahí, eh, una vez que está traducido, o, por, o aunque sea escrito, transcribe en, en inglés, luego se puede, eh, con Google Translate, el, YouTube, el mismo YouTube lo puede traducir es. como pueda, lo mejor que pueda, a cualquier idioma. Y eh, hablamos de donaciones y ahí, eh, si quieres hacer donación, también puede hacer... El Free Software Foundation, como siempre. Sí, la free, el IFF, uh, free Software Foundation, la IFF. Freedom of the Press, uh, ACLU. Suscribiros a la revista. Si tienes algo local buena. en tu país, haz donación ahí. Eso. O ayúdalos a organizar un evento. Si necesitan voluntarios, voluntarios es una de las formas más fáciles de contribuir. Tener cuidado, no contribuís a gente, que no lo que hace de los bolsillos grandes. Que eso hay mucho en el movimiento de la seguridad. Por eso, siempre buscar movimientos que son de verdad de comunidad y que son leales al movimiento hacker, básicamente. Okay. Que hay de todo últimamente, hay que tener cuidado. <risa> ¿Y, uh, ¿Y ya? Y creo que ya, porque si no se hace esto muy grande, ¿no? Sí. Y vamos a volver cada dos semanas. Es Eso la idea. Espero, si se puede, es la idea. Si a ustedes les gusta, eh, díganos algo en eh, los comentarios, difunde la información, eh, haznos saber que, si te gusta. Perdonad si no por mi lenguaje, que llevo viviendo en Estados Unidos ya como <risa> casi 15 años. Sí, a mí el, el español y... es mi tercer idioma también. Y claro, y como siempre estoy hablando en inglés con toda la peña aquí, pues se me va la pelota un poco. Cada vez que vuelvo a, a España o voy a Colombia o algo, estoy ahí una semana y otra vez lo pillo todo, pero cuando vuelvo aquí estoy un mes o dos, otra vez. Y bueno, se me empiezan a olvidar las palabras en español, empieza el acento así medio yankee, ya, vamos, bueno, yo manera. por mi acento, seguro que habrán adivinado, yo soy de Venezuela, Caracas y Valencia, y eh, saludos, a, <risa> saludos a todos los amigos en eh, México, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Argentina. Chile, Arge eh, sí, eso es. Ecuador, Perú, eh, que se nos olvida, Ecuador, bueno, luego Centroamérica, Colombia, eh, eh, Colombia Honduras, Guatemala... Eh, Costa Rica, El Salvador Puerto Rico que aunque seas Puerto una Rico, colonia claro. de Estados Unidos lo siento, ya tendréis la independencia eh, y eh, ¿dónde es el otro país que hablan español en África? ¿Guinea Ecuatorial? sí, hay varios países hispanos por ahí también, pero vamos la verdad bueno, es que saludos a todos ustedes no soy un profesor de la española <risa> así que no <risa> bueno, y saludos a mi gente Cuba, de... saludos a Cuba Oh, saludos a Cuba, obviamente. Oh, saludos a mi gente de Alicante, en España. Oye, si ustedes en Cuba nos ven, eh, porque en Cuba no tienen eh, internet. O sea, lo tienen, pero de a poquito. Sí, tienen, sí, sí tienen, pero sí. muy lento. Eh. Bueno, eso es lo que nos dicen. Mm. Yo no me he cronado que me digan. Yeah. Bueno, <risa> no sé si nada. ustedes están en Cuba, díganos que díganos cómo, es la cómo está la situación allá. por ahí y a lo mejor podemos ayudar. Sí. Y, eh, ok, entonces, eh, hasta la próxima vez, Tivo, Rec2, Hackerñol.net, Hackerñol.